I've talked to Trump maybe uh, more recently than ever. Same guy. Um, but I don't agree with him. I don't agree with the pulling out of our troops out of Syria and abandoning the Kurds. I don't agree with the down uh, way we're pulling out of Afghanistan at the time. I didn't want 5,000 troops, but I thought 1,200 was fine. I disagree with him um, on a few things. And he didn't like that, but I think he respected it. But what the audience goes crazy especially early when you disagree with what the president's doing, that, mm -hmm. you know, General Mattis is not a bad general. It's not a good thing to say I like people that didn't get captured. Doesn't mean I hate Trump, but I am not going to pretend to saying that about John McCain was right. <laughs>— And joining me today is the co-anchor of Fox & Friends, the host of the Brian Kilmeade radio show, the host of One Nation on Fox News, and a New York Times best-selling author, Brian Kilmeade. Brian, finally, welcome to The Rubin Report. — Yeah, nice to see you, Dave. — That is quite a resume. You know, sometimes we bring on guests, it can be a kind of thin resume, I gotta get to it easily, but you do a lot of stuff, right. and I think that's a uh, point being driven home by the fact that I think you're standing right now, like you gotta go in a second. Right, no, I prefer the standing desk. And I know you talk about these guys with thin resume, it's because you're talking about Joe Rogan, right? That guy <laughs> doesn't really do much and you have trouble finding a reason to interview him. Yes, he's not doing much out there. But you have like 87 shows, people see you all the time. You also, you're on Gutfeld all the time, you're, you're guest hosting on every other with show. You. You, you're, yeah, we're, we're doing the show together, all that good stuff. But I'm curious, I actually don't know a ton about you beyond your, your Fox life. I was curious just a little bit about like history, childhood, yeah. growing up, what, what got you into this, this crazy media situation? So Dave, it's really none of your business. So uh, <laughs> I just wish you'd back off and stop with the personal questions. Sorry, oh, this man. This is Barbara Walters. I mean, what's going on here? We wanna um, make you cry by the end of this thing, you know? Yes, I am, I am crying uh, inside. Um, basically I, uh, played to uh, my big thing was growing up. I was a big time soccer player. Wanted to be great. Wasn't my whole, uh, family, uh, my whole town went to college, played uh, soccer at, at post, but the whole time, by the time I got to college, it was pretty clear. Not only was this, was, wasn't there a pro league, but I wasn't nearly in the conversation with anything like that. Although all my friends were, which is certainly humbling. And then I always wanted to do radio TV really since ninth grade. And that's what I was always pushing for, whether it's at the campus radio station or interning at NBC, um, doing the history of late night television as my senior project. Uh, I've got an interview with Letterman when I was still in college, not for a job, but actually for the air, for radio. Oh, wow. And that's what I wanted to do. And I, I went right, took all that momentum and all that drive and went right to Bennigan's where I kept waitering <laughs> right after college, uh, trying to get that first job. So I started my own local show. Got a bunch of sponsors, got a limo deal, got a clothing deal, wow. uh, got a catering deal, uh, got a little sponsor money, built a set, and realized because in our business, was it was pre-podcast days, if you don't have a tape, you're not going to get a job. They don't care about your school, your grades. So I was able to get a tape then, work on my accent, uh, start doing stand-up along the way because that will be an opportunity that no one could deny you. There's always a stage to go up on, even if it's a terrible one in the middle of a diner at 5, 8, 5 p.m. Yep. So it would be a great way to get composure and be able to react to an audience. And then went out to L.A. and got a job at a TV station, doing all sports radio on the weekends and doing stand-up, probably making $27,000 all in all. Uh -huh. You know, I remember I was getting paid five ninety six every two weeks to do to work in TV, at uh, which was these. What happens is these the Home Shopping Network bought a bunch of stations so they can get on cable, and to have to get on, they had to form their own news service. So I'd go in there with a one news director and two people, and we do all the copy, do all the interviews, do all the booking. So it was a great way to get experience. Then got a job uh, back here in New York for thirty five thousand dollars a year doing uh, sports. And I was doing that and it was great to be home. Uh, the only thing bad about it, after three months I got fired. The new guy they hired was actually the anchor, masquerading as the news director. The news director became the sports guy and then I'm <laughs> out of a job. And then I was able to, to claw my way back into new sport, get an interview with Fox in 96, started filling in and I've been able to hold on to the job ever since. So I got extremely lucky after 12 years. Yeah, that's what they always say. It's an overnight success, but where the hell were you 
for those first, yeah. you know, 12, 15, 20 years. Do you miss a little bit of that kind of, I didn't realize that you had started a bunch of things yourself and all that, and, and as you said, before podcasting, do you miss a little of that grind? Because you're in a pretty smooth system right now. When I, Whenever I do anything with Fox and I saw you at the Patriot Awards, it's like, Fox just does a nice job of programming and it's good and it works yeah. and it's, yeah. Do you miss any of that, the, the messiness? Well, a couple of things that I was able to do, you know, like the scramble where you're out on your own, like you're doing when you go and do speaking events and you get people there. The, I have a little of that with the book. So when the books come out, it's up to us to chart something that Fox is going to okay that allows us to go do personal appearances. And you try to get out there to different uh, theaters or different events, or either in, uh, even breweries, and you try to get 500 people there to do a book signing. Or you go to a theater and you try to get between 500 and 1,200 people there. And I'll talk about all my books at once. So that's a little of the grind and the entrepreneurship. But within the one thing at Fox, I think you picked up, you know, Fox and Friends is a machine. But within those interviews, if I have Dave Rubin one on one, I do what I want mm -hmm. and I talk to the producers. If I have, um, you know, Trey Gowdy has a book out or Mike Pompeo has a book out, you know, confer with the producers, but pretty much you do what you want. But that's a machine. Like Fox and Friends is a logo for a reason. It's going to be successful with or without the talent, no matter who it is. They'll get the right people in there because they know exactly what they want. But the radio show, I feel as though within that three hours, I could do what I want. You know, there's people that we can't book because it's, you know, I'm not going to see if Anderson Cooper's available, <laughs> uh, you know, the rivals. But for the most part, you do what you want. And then on the weekend show, I really feel like the Saturday show at 8 Eastern is – it's kind of my thing with great producers and everyone collaborates. So within this great machine, the New York Yankees, before anyone knew they were the New York Yankees, you can be yourself. So that's the grind a little bit. And I just feel so relieved every day. So Dave, we meet so many talented people that don't have great jobs, even mm -hmm. though they're great. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is opportunity. And the only thing I'm gonna give myself credit for is knowing how great this opportunity was and not thinking there was something uh, the grass was greener because I, after those 12 years and talking to people while I'm here, I know the grass is not greener. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I feel like I know you pretty well, a, a little bit off camera, but most, mostly on camera and through radio and all that kind of stuff. And we've been doing this for eight or 10 minutes. You haven't said anything about politics. And I wonder, are, do you consider yourself really like a political animal or more of a TV animal? Uh, I mean, if you ask me, uh, Brian, format a show, you don't have to, you know, Fox just wants a show. I love I love the politics of it. I was glad to leave sports. I got like busy. I, you know, it's good to like a team again. When you do sports, I don't know how the other people feel, but after a while, it was a job. I wasn't really enjoying going to games. Yeah. Hey, the Mets are playing 730 tonight. You can go cover the game. I'm like, aren't you a Mets fan? I'm like, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, I, I don't really need to go deal with the traffic, go back and forth. It took the fun out of it. So, but I love doing the politics. I love it because it's a lot like sports, as you know. What's the strategy? What are you going to do to support it? You know, so instead of fans, you got money to support the candidate. And then you have the issues. And besides the issues, uh, what are you going to do to get out the vote? There's so many different elements that I'm into. So you have these great candidates but couldn't get their message out. Great candidates that couldn't get any support. And then the phenomenon of Trump, which no one's ever going to figure out. Uh, whether you love him or hate him, no one's ever seen anything like this. And that, to me, to be able to go talk to Trump and get a chance to meet these people and, you know, and get a chance to interact with people that make decisions that affect the future of a country, to me, I love that stuff. I mean, I love foreign policy the most. To me, I, I love if, uh, like, when Pompeo comes in uh, and Condoleezza Rice comes in or any uh, any president comes in, vice president. And I love diving into relationships. What's Erdogan like? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going on with the tanks? What do you mean Germany doesn't want to get? What's so good about their, the leopard tank? Why can't we all, oh, you need jet fuel for the Abrams. So I love that stuff. So I think maybe, um, I did, I thought my easiest way in was sports, but my sustainability, I think is my, is, is I'm so into it. Like I can't wait to open up the notes for Fox and friends at three in the morning. And they have every major thing that happened and all the sound bites that stood out from all the nighttime shows and some of the daytime shows. I can't wait to kind of file that together and assemble, help assemble the radio show and 
give my pitches for the TV show. So I love that stuff. You know, it's funny, you'll appreciate this. I, I wanted, when I was in college, to be a sports center anchor. That That's what I thought I was gonna be. I, you know, that's when- I can see that. That's when, it, you know, it was the big show with Keith Olbermann and, and Dan Patrick. Olbermann obviously went completely insane, but yep. I, that's what I wanted to do. I guess I didn't quite do that, but just like you, I kind of did something similar. But first, you're saying you're a Mets fan. Now, we're of a similar age, so the question is, and I'm from New York too, where were you on game six, 1986? You have to remember. Yes. Uh, game six, I was literally at Bennigan's and I did the daytime shift and we stood there and we roped off an area, still wearing my khaki shorts and my collared shirt. And we stood there and watched it. And then uh, I, I was able to go to game seven. You were at uh, game so seven? Got, yeah. Wow. And guess how we got in? Pre 9-11. Not proud of this, but I am, kind of. Yeah. We snuck in. We waited for the big crowd, and we went in between the turnstiles. Wow. And I was able to get into the stadium and sit on the steps and watch it. How crazy is that? Man, they, I mean, that they would never let that fly these days. But Oh, no, you'd be arrested. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. They, they game we'll six. They'll find that cable in prison. I was in Syosset, Long Island. I was 10 years old having a having a sleepover with my buddy John. I will never forget that ball going right through Buckner's legs and— the rest is history, as they say. Right. You thought that we'd have a championship in 87, and then 88, and then 90. But who knew they were doing all types of drugs and hitting each other's guts and uh, womanizing. I remember one time Dwight Gooden came into Bennigan's because it's very close. It's on the way to the stadium. And he sat by himself, by himself, and had three Long Island iced teas. <laughs> now, he wasn't <laughs> pitching, but they had a game that night. You don't drink a Long Island iced tea unless you want to be drunk. And I'm like... Wait a second. Why would you want to be drunk and watch a game? Clearly, there was an issue there. Uh, and we watched these guys go in and out of Smithers for a few years. That was educational. <laughs> right, exactly. For those that don't understand, the Long Island iced tea basically has every liquor known to man. So About if you're five drink, liquors. Yeah, if you're drinking three of those, you're in trouble. Let me ask you something. You mentioned, you mentioned the Trump thing and how that kind of flipped everything on its head. What was that like kind of going from you know, you're doing, you're doing Fox and Friends, you're doing the morning show, all that stuff, and things are kind of normal, or at least old school, the way we thought politics was. Then everything just kind of get blown apart, and now, and now we're in whatever it is we're in now, this kind of post-Trump, I don't even mean that politically, but just where media has just been completely blown apart. Well, I know that he did destroy every network, and he tries to destroy us, thankfully he hasn't. I, I, because they built something sustainable at Fox, it's gonna withstand any candidate, even though you know, after the election, the fact that we said the other guy won, he tried to blow us up and it definitely hurt the ratings. Um, what was it like? I, I said to myself the whole time, why don't, why can't he win? I, go, I don't get it. And when I saw him come to the debate and do the opposition research on everyone on that stage and go after the leader first, Jeb, I go, this guy's into winning. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy is going to win. Why can't he? And then to be on CNN the next day on a phone or MSNBC the next day on a phone or I watched him dominate the media cycle. But what people don't appreciate is that politicians don't answer the question. He was the first in a long time to almost answer every question. McCain was very, Barry Goldwater, they say, and I read his books, was very br brusque, you know, and very direct. McCain was kind of direct. You know, they write that Harry Truman was direct. But Trump would take everything literally take everything. He did it on our show for eight years minimum, mm -hmm. once a week. And all he was, he'd call up and go, what's going on? He'd say, we give him three topics. Very rare for him to say, I don't want to talk about that. And I'm saying, that's a guy that doesn't care, but now he's running for election and he had the same attitude. So he, he ratcheted up the game for everyone. If you're giving out rote lines like, uh, you know, the, the same catchphrases, you weren't going to work against Trump. So I think he changed that. Put everyone on the defensive. You know, Hillary Clinton still doesn't know what hit her. Neither does Jeb Bush know what hit him. I was with Jeb Bush last month, and I still think, to a degree, I like him, too. He's a great person, whether you voted for him or not. Um, he's still rattled. So we've never seen anything like Trump or since, and I don't think being a bully is it. It's not being a bully. If there's something about the directness where he's a rich guy his whole life, but yet most of the people that like him aren't rich and never will be. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen it. Like, and you could say, well, he's rich. Well, the rich people don't like him. If you talk to rich, successful people, they didn't want any part of Trump. They go, because rich, successful people aren't that outgoing and, and brash. 
and brag, uh, braggadocio in the way he handled things. He goes, we're not like that. We have more money than Trump. And so he connected with a whole part of the audience no one expected. And they certainly don't eat steak well done with ketchup. That seems to be the, uh, the main issue. Right. I did not know. Does he have ketchup on his steak? Oh, yeah. I did not steak well done with ketchup. That, that's the thing that he's doing at Mar-a-Lago or wherever else he's eating these days. Um, you mentioned the thing about how he sort of tried to burn the place down or he was angry at Fox over things. Do you worry about that sometimes? Because it's interesting. I find on Fox, there is a plurality of opinion. You know, Tucker's yeah. always bringing on people to argue with. And that really isn't happening on the other cable channels. You know, they'll bring in sort of like a fake conservative to basically agree with them, but are you worried at times when you guys are doing the shows that you know a certain segment of your audience might be angry at you at this, or you got to get them back, or all of that kind of stuff? Well, Dave, I'll tell you, I go on Truth Social. Yeah. By the way, I, I've I've talked to Trump maybe uh, more recently than ever. Same guy, um, but I don't agree with him. I don't agree with the pulling out of our troops out of Syria and abandoning the Kurds. I don't agree with the down. Uh, we were pulling out of Afghanistan at the time. I didn't want five thousand troops, but I thought twelve hundred was fine. I disagree with him um, on a few things, and he didn't like that, but I think he respected it. But what the audience goes crazy, especially early when you disagree with what the president's doing, that mm -hmm. you know, General Mattis is not a bad general. It's not a good thing to say, I like people that didn't get captured. Doesn't mean I hate Trump, but I am not going to pretend to saying that about John McCain was right. And the whole audience will go crazy. I go in Truth Social just to you know, I'll put something up there once in a while or cut and paste them. My show's coming up. 50% of the comments are negative to me uh, because if you say anything against Trump, but who in your life do you agree with 100% yeah. of the time and you're not lying? Not even myself. Right. Yeah. You evolve. The thing that's cool about Fox is they never tell you what to say. You get your own research, got your own brain room. I will tell you, I am all for whatever it takes to, for Ukraine. Maybe you're not. I know Tucker is not. Yeah. I don't think Laura is. Not sure about Sean. But I don't think it matters. No one said to me, agree with Tucker. And Tucker's certainly not checking with me. But he has insightful things to say to back up what he says. So that's called a debate. That's called, I watched four hours of Fox and I learned a couple of, uh, a couple of sides of a debate. You know, and we and it's not, no one's personal. I, ho I hope Tucker's not mad at me, but I vehemently disagree about Ukraine. Well, so, my guess is he. My guess is he's not mad at you, and you guys still manage, at least at the TV level. It seems like everyone kind of likes each other. I've been on Gutfeld yeah. with you, where Tucker will call in, or you know, when they do the transitions between shows, you guys are messing around. Last time I saw you, I mean, Gutfeld was hitting you hard, and you were going right back at him. It's all done in fun, and that's very different than what goes on on the other channels. Like when Lemon used to have to hand it off to Cuomo or whichever which way it was, and it was like, man, you guys really hate each other. Well, a couple of things. Cuomo and Don Lemon were best friends. You're my buddy. And the minute Cuomo yeah, started blowing right. up, Don Lemon's like, why is he still here? Yeah. So, you know, so that is like, the, that's the problem with CNN. They're not real. That's not real. Whatever it is, it's real. Like, so if you have a disagreement on the five, the producers want to make sure it doesn't get personal. It keeps it on mm -hmm. the issues. But I'm telling you, I go, I'm going to do the five on Thursday. I did the five last Thursday. You disagree with Geraldo or whatever. No yeah. one's saying you don't disagree. Right. And that's just it. You know what I think it is, Dave? You do the same thing. It's a slice of life. So you go in there and you might argue with your best friend sometimes. But the thing is you have responsibility to do is research. And if you know the players, make the call. And if you could text them and you say, what were you thinking about on that gun legislation? And Senator John Cornyn got back to me and said, Brian, let me tell you exactly what I'm thinking. Let me tell you what my red line is. So when I go sit on that couch... I'll say, I'll either say it directly unless they tell me to. I'll say, Senator John Cornyn's view is this. When I say that, I'll have my own opinion, but I'll do my own research. So that's called hustle mistakes. So if you, if I end up being wrong about something, mm -hmm. it's not because I'm winging it. And I think most anchors here are like that. I mean, look at Greg. You realize to come up with those opinions, how well read he has to be on those issues. And then knowing that he's watching the show, watching the channel all week and he's going, okay, Everyone's saying the same thing. I got to be different. And I got to offer that at 11 o'clock, whether it's at the 5 or 11, you know, when he tapes at 630. So I just think that people understand here, it's like having a paper due every day on four all, different topics. All that being said, does Geraldo believe some of this stuff? Come on. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he has a way of being controversial. <laughs> but uh, the other day he hopped on and just said about the about the classified documents in in Biden's place. He said nobody cares. It's not a big deal. Of course, people care. Mm-hmm. You know, how could you say that? I know you might not. You might think it's not going to solve the economic problems. Well, you think about the hypocrisy, the way he took it, how the fact that he has these these classified documents where they'll they'll put a, a marine in jail. Yeah, but the president can have thirty five documents, and you can raid the former president's house, but ask permission on his. Don't tell me that's not an unbelievable story. But that's how he feels. There's one thing about Araldo; he's got so much practical firsthand experience, and he also fundamentally wants people to get along. I think he looks at his life, he experienced more in 10 years than I will in 10 lifetimes. And I think at this point in his life, he wants everyone to come together, but it's impossible. Yeah, it's just not, it's not a reality. Let me ask you something else, off, off politics and TV for a sec. You guys are in New York. Uh, I grew up in New York, lived in Manhattan most of my adult life. Um, when I go back to New York, it is not the same New York anymore. Uh, you know, where you guys are midtownish. You don't see a lot of business people anymore. It seems like it's kind of barren and a lot of barricades. What what do you think's going on over there? Do you think, did you think that Adams maybe was gonna be a little bit better than de Blasio? Like what, what's the state of the city right now? I think uh, I think Adams is 50%, maybe 70% better than de Blasio. Number one, yeah. he cares. Number two is, I think that um, it is definitely dangerous. And the main reason is not so much, not only do we not have enough cops, None of them have been empowered. The, qual- the qualified immunity is not there. They're not making the small arrests, shoplifting. You basically can shoplift now. Yep. And if I'm a small business owner, you are now in bodegas locking the stuff down. This is totally fixable. It's not that gangs have taken over New York. Criminals have. The same 300 commit something like the same 30,000 crimes. It's all fixable, but the problem is Albany. Albany's a super majority to the left, and they don't have to deal with the crime and the danger that Adam Klotz, our meteorologist, dealt with yeah, over the yeah, weekend. Yeah. Watch a guy get beat up. You step in, and you get beat up by eight guys. And the guys that get caught don't even get detained. That's the problem. There's no hell to pay for the hell they're causing. But, but why is that, why is that an Albany thing and not directly a city thing related to Adams and what he's doing with he the can't police? Re- he can't reverse the no cash bail law and he can't the judges have no discretion on if they can prosecute or not so you come in and if it's a certain crime i don't care what you did you're out on your own you have got to appear again in a certain amount of time so everything's knocked down they don't want to put they're trying to close rikers island so there's nowhere to put people and you literally have somebody who's arrested the person who was arrested breaking into al pacino's house was arrested something like 37 times for break-ins. Mm-hmm. I mean, that person would have been arre- twice, maybe once they would have gone away. So if you're a cop, really? I got to worry about if I see somebody who might be a minority and I'm a white guy and I see something going on there and I see all the iPhones rolling, do I want to risk my life for $35,000 a year and get sued and have my whole family brought through the mud? Unless it's something big, I'm not going to get that involved. But you see how easy it would be to get everybody in their front foot again? But I do think Adams at least gets it. And they have they have a lot of pride in putting him down. He went up twice to Albany and say you gotta change cash bail law. They basically told him don't come back. So, I mean, I, I do think he cares. Um I, I do still have hope. Brian, I got one more for you because I know you're a busy guy. You got eighty seven shows to do. Is the rumor true? that Greg Gutfeld will be playing a munchkin in the remake of Wizard of Oz? Nope. You know why? Because there's too many others. If it was a story of one major (laughs) munchkin ruling over other munchkins, he would never be a part of a class or an understudy. He would never get Best Supporting Actor. He would have uh, Best Leading Actor without any supporting actor over and over again. So he'd have to be the center of attention. Um... No, Greg. Uh, Greg's story is pretty phenomenal. I was I was pretty stunned to see, uh, listen to uh, Joe Rogan talk about it because the outsider perspective. Because I consider you part of us. Yeah. If you yeah. hope you don't mind. No, I, I, I have my foot in both worlds. I, I love it. I love yeah. doing the Fox stuff and I love doing the Rogan stuff. It's it's both worlds that right. I get to see and be part of. Yeah. Right, and he has no idea like the the people. Let's say, but he's just talking about, and he's a comedian, 
and he's saying how the Tonight Show used to have everything. There's no doubt why Gutfeld's most successful. Is there any doubt? The reason why he's most successful is it's normal guys talking about funny stuff. Nobody, everybody else is just is left comedy and is now like a new show with a point of view with people that can't ask questions. And Gutfeld is a real show. You actually laugh. I watched the cold open of SNL with Fox Sports. And I said, this is like bad for a high school <laughs> variety show. Are they even rehearsing? It's so, horrible. And that's why Greg, uh, Greg deserves a lot of credit because it's the same show he's doing on Red Eye. You know, and he just kept doing it, kept doing it at midnight. Uh, and it was getting great ratings, and now he's killing it on uh, being himself on Saturday. But just it really is that mistake. simple. When when we did the uh, the Fox Nation thing a couple weeks ago, we're about to start the show. Remember, and Greg turns to me and he said that he had diarrhea, and then I was like, I'm going to use that during the show, and then you'd roll with it, and everybody's laughing, and you're giving him crap about it, no pun intended, and that's what it's all about. <laughs> How are we ending on crap and Gutfeld? Give me something. You're a, you're a TV host. End the show professionally, please. Hey, I'm going to end the show professionally. Let me see. Um, Dave, you're a deep thinker who also could do stand-up and does it. Uh, you do it all, and somehow you find time to get a slice of my life. I am honored to be asked to be on. Uh, thanks so much. And promise me, next time, and there will be a next time, don't bring up Greg Gutfeld. <laughs> there will be no Gutfeld next time. Kilmeade, you're a true pro. I hope to see you in person soon. And uh, now now get back to work. Sayasu misses you. Go get him. If you're looking for more uncensored opinions from today's thought leaders, check out our media playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a wide variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.